yeah, joining workshop number six. We're all excited to have you here. This is workshop six with Larry Kimura and Bruce Torres Fisher. And yeah, I think I'll let you folks take it away. Hi, aloha, ahi ahi, kako. I'm saying good evening because this is about uh, 7.20 p.m. in Hilo, Hawaii. And my name is Larry Kimura. I'm an associate professor here at the College of Hawaiian Language. Kahakaula o Ke'elikolani is the name, the Hawaiian name of our Hawaiian uh, language college at the Hilo campus of the University of Hawaii system on the island of Hawaii. And uh, we have a real big topic this evening. Uh, let me in give some time here to my co-host. Aloha kako, my name is Bruce Torres Fisher. Good evening, I'm a master's student here at Kahakaula Oke'eliko Lani, and I also work in the Kani Aina um, Hawaiian Digitization Project with Dr. Kimura, my boss, and we're happy to be here this evening. Aloha. And that's partially why uh, Mr. Bruce is, Torres Fisher is here this evening because he's a student worker right now working on a documentation uh, project that we just started. We're in the third year of our initial uh, establishment of the Kani Aina uh, audio. First, we're, we're using first uh, Kani Aina. Kani meaning the sound and Aina is our land. So the, the sound coming emitting from our land and we hopefully are trusting that that sound is a great sound because it's our language. So this evening's presentation is, a, is about that sound, regenerating speakers of Hawaiian language. Uh, we in Hawaii, like I presume in many uh, indigenous uh, uh, countries of the world where we have our native languages still or maybe sleeping as some people may refer to that. I hope not too much in, in bed sleeping, but we are in Hawaii anyway, in a state of endangerment. Although we have progressed, uh, we believe somewhat, uh, we still have a lot more of, uh, uh, I call, I'm calling this like a talk story more than a uh, workshop. So we will take some breaks in between for questions and answers, because what, what we are relating this evening about regenerating new Hawaiian spe or speakers of Hawaiian is about our experience, but we would like to empathize, hopefully, as much as possible with everybody else. And that's a big, uh, we, can't, we cannot know every, the, the, empathize with everybody's situation. So we're going to try and uh, share, hopefully, uh, things that maybe we can learn from and you can learn from. So we can only speak from our situation here in Hawaii. And uh, hopefully through your questions and our answers, hopefully we can possibly assist one another. So uh, Hawaiian speakers. Uh, as so as we're, um, we'll, we have a PowerPoint, so we'll just show, we have a very short PowerPoint, but let's start off with our first slide because it'll illustrate the, um, of course, the topic, and as you see, of course, regenerating Hawaiian speakers, but this little uh, seedling or sprout of a new plant is actually going to grow into a large tree. This is a core seedling, just sprouting up among the lava rocks of Hawaii, and uh, it will eventually grow into a huge tree, the largest tree that we in Hawaii use to carve our sailing vessel that happens to be called in English, a canoe. In Hawaiian, we call it a wa'a. 
in other Polynesian languages. Maybe some of you have recently uh, kept up with the two-year voyage around the world of our uh, sailing uh, va'a, double hull va'a, okulea. So our canoe that we'll be talking about this evening or using the metaphor of this canoe for the regenerating of Hawaiian speakers is a single hull canoe. So let's get to a, a picture of our uh, canoe here where uh, we're using again this sailing craft to illustrate different facets of the revitalization of uh, Hawaiian language in connection to the relationship of each major part. There's, there are many parts to this craft, but we're selecting certain parts, especially let's begin with The keel belongs to the hull of the canoe, so I presume most of you know where the hull of the canoe is, and that in Hawaiian is called kuamo'o, and that we will use to uh, represent the intergroup or the group that is central to a kind of a start for this movement of keeping our language afloat. And then uh, we could move over to the, as we see the canoe here on the right side, we see the iako or the outrigger boom or the spar that is representing our relationship to the institutional organizations of our society. And then of course we have the ama or the float that connects to the governmental institutions. And therefore, we are doing what we're calling here, of course, at this conference, our connections or relations uh, to one another. Um, then, of course, the sail. My goodness, we need the sail. And that's the pea in Hawaiian. And that would represent our families, our immediate communities, our general society as a whole, but basically the familial. And of course, uh, we need a steering paddle to keep us on course. And that steering paddle, or hoi will be representing our regenerated speakers. They hold the key to where our canoe will be heading. So we're using this metaphor of the canoe uh, and to represent this topic this evening uh, to regenerate Hawaiian speakers, because it shows very clearly, I think, the connections or the relationships of different groups, entities, one to the other, and that all play a major role in keeping our canoe in good sailing order that we may successfully do our voyaging. Now, we're using the actual forest, the ulula'au, where that little uh, sapling, I mean seedling of the koa uh, uh, tree that was just sprouting has now joined the rest of the uh, whole environment here, the forest, a mess of greens and, and, and all these botanical connections that will represent your situation, our situation, everybody's situation is a little different, but there is a mess of things. Sometimes it gets pretty complicated. And um, uh, oftentimes I hear the statement that with language, it's hard to recognize whether it's still there or not. In fact, language is almost like the last thing that we turn around and look and say, what happened to it? It's not part of our forest. And of course, hopefully this evening, I'm saying this evening for us in Hilo again, but for you, I, I don't know what time it is for you there, but it's um, apparent for us, it's apparent that language is crucial. So I will not uh, have to emphasize that. However, in the reality of, of our individual situations, and I'm speaking for Hawaii now as well. 
we lost our consciousness after a while about our language. And so you see some key words right in sovereignty, colonization, shift, endangerment, and cultural awakening, or renaissance is another word. And again, I need to remind you, this is what's applicable. This is not everything in this uh, sophisticated forest here, but we're picking out key concepts that relate to this uh, theme of regenerating our language in Hawaii. Now, uh, in everybody else's situation or country or community or wherever you are, there are many, many variables that come into play. So we could say for Hawaii, there may be some typical variables, uh, typical meaning not all countries, but many countries share the same thing called um, language endangerment, language shift, even colonization. Be something unique to certain countries such as Hawaii and uh, cultural reawakening might be unique to certain places such as Hawaii. However, uh, as I'm saying, we know, I know, and Bruce and I know mostly about our forests and how perhaps we can begin to exchange uh, thoughts about this your forests, our forests, the differences, the similarities, and how they come into play for the concern about that uh, sprouting little uh, uh, start of that co-op tree and how it turns into a core tree that could be, um, how does how's that expression go? Seeing the forest from the trees but actually, <laughs> of course, we want to select a core log if we want to continue on a journey, a mission. And of course, that uh, uh, mission would be for the reclamation, the revitalization, doing something about keeping our language going because it's important to us at this conference. So uh, to begin to explain a bit about the Hawaiian situation, as you know, we, we are one of the most isolated locations in the world. And probably that, of course, is the reason we were one of the most uh, last places to be so-called discovered. We were not discovered, we discovered them because the first contact we had happened to be from, from Europe by way of Captain uh, James, uh, James He arrived to the shores on the island of Kauai. We have eight major islands here. He happened to come in, I think, January of 19, uh, 1778. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as thinking goes in his time, uh, he said, I'm going to name these islands as if we didn't have a name, but he said, it's going to name it after the Earl of Sandwich. So he called the islands the Sandwich Islands. Then he left for a little while and continued in his northern uh, journey up to the west coast of uh, the Americas, especially North America. And then eventually he came back again in the early following in uh, February of uh, 1779 and uh, spent time again here. And uh, he was, uh, you know, at first uh, this, and we have to take the point of view of our people seeing this craft, the ship. Uh, of course, he was thought of as a god because of these great white sails that he had on his ship. And that was just at the time of the new year in Hawaii, we celebrate the Makahiki or the new year at the rising of the Pleiades. And then of course, of the setting of the Pleiades later on in about, what's that? March, April or so. And the ending of that season, uh, that uh, calendar season of the new year where we celebrate 
our uh, harvest and uh, all of our, our uh, I guess, our, what we would consider health, uh, health in many ways, but of course, uh, food was very important. So here comes the ship and uh, he's part of the celebration. Uh, he's thought of as the god Lono of agriculture, but uh, eventually, of course, that was uh, soon dis discerned that he wasn't so much of a god. And of course, he met his unfortunate fate here. Uh, he was killed here at the shores of Kaavaloa in Kealakekua Bay, where we have a monument in his remembrance until today. So uh, what our people recognized immediately were the difference, the difference. And there were maybe some similarities. Apparently our people knew about metal. Hawaii has no metal. The hardest things we have are stone rocks, but we use stone to carve our canoes, to carve many things, build our homes and other kinds of crafts that needed to be done. But Just items such as what they use the metal for. They had these, uh, I guess you call them, not telescopes, but, uh, and uh, look and glass that they could, uh, this, just this whole um, world of uh, difference. And they are people of course, recognize the uh, use of the metal in weapons that they had. They had guns, they had swords. I mean, that little, that one, well, maybe not a little skirmish that put an end to uh, Mr. Cook's life, Captain Cook's life occurred be with that kind of uh, fighting going on using weaponry from Europe and our own weaponry uh, here in Hawaii, which did not, of course, include gunpowder, bullets, and, and, sh and long swords and things like that. So immediately our people were impacted. I always think that uh, here in Hawaii, we would not run up to the hills because if we ran up to the hills, we'll just have to come down to the other side where our, our islands are only so many square miles large, you know, we don't go on and on and on like on continents. So in a way it was good, in a way it may not be good, but that is the, real, is the reality of our geographic uh, islands here. We are island kingdom, our island place, I should say, I was getting into the sovereignty because at that time we were still a sovereign people. We governed ourselves according to our traditional way of governance. But immediately, I think our, 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 our future king, who was in his early 20s, there is a much larger world out there that our, our hokulea canoe didn't take us out to do a complete circuit of the whole globe at that time. But we're mainly, mainly traveling uh, open ocean navigation in the thousands and thousands of miles here in the large Pacific Ocean. So uh, this uh, uh, recognition was very uh, critical in the, uh, the transitioning from that kind of culture where some people would call it Stone Age because we didn't have metal. We didn't have all these other I guess you could say advancements that the uh, that uh, metal and other kinds of natural uh, resources provided other countries with. Therefore, uh, an English canoe is a canoe, not necessarily. Well, of course, ours is made out of the core, uh, not the uh, the birch, uh, the bark birch, and certain countries that. They call that a canoe. Ours has an outrigger for, like most of our, our Pacific countries have uh, canoes with outriggers, traditional canoes. Therefore, I mean, I'm just saying that this movement 
from contact into a new world happened in Hawaii very quickly, very quickly. And uh, one sign of that quick transition was, I believe there's no documentation on this, but this, the ships that came here, of course, they were coming here for exploration. They were coming to find new resources or resources they had heard about or had actually received from wanted to discover more what we would call today, uh, I guess, uh, how do we build our strength? How do we become a bigger, uh, a stronger country by showing our might through uh, industrialization, uh, having more uh, resources to exchange, bartering, money, economy, and that kind of advancement. And that's, those are the kinds of people that were coming to the shores of Hawaii at that time. And our people saw something that was quite remarkable to them where someone would just pick up, I don't know if they were using a feather pen or some kind of a pen and put something down on a piece of paper, show it to somebody and immediately a major action or activity took place. I'm talking, of course, about writing. That introduction of writing came immediately with the Western ships that arrived here. So by the time we credit the Protestant American missionaries that came to Hawaii in 1820, our people knew about writing. They had created a word for it by associating it with what they knew, of course, in our culture, which was tattooing or the word tattoo, of course, comes from tatau or kakau in Hawaii. And uh, of course, that's in the Webster's Dictionary now. And th that word, that action is the act today, kakau in Hawaiian for the act of writing. And they associated the result of writing on a uh, what we had a uh, cloth, uh, bark cloth, so almost like paper. And as we put our designs on that paper, some of those designs sort of look like, you know, something like this. I mean, you couldn't read it, then, but it looked like fancy designs on, on, a, on a bark cloth. And this is palapala, palapala. Pala pala. So these are words that were used in those early times to see what was going on. Our people very observant, very curious, noticing the power of something like this in the hand of somebody writing on top of this. Well, they didn't know they called it kakao. And then they didn't know how to to uh, comprehend or understand this. Of course, this was a major, major uh, interest. One of the items, there are many things that happened, of course, uh, in the exchange, but this exchange was crucial when the uh, missionaries came in 1820, the American, uh, Calvinists or Protestant missionaries, American border missionaries in 1820 and uh, in 1826. It took them a little while to, to uh, come up with an alphabet. And now we have a writing system. And of course, by that time, we had established a monarchy. And those, those kings and chiefs and chiefesses at the time demanded that they be taught first because they knew the power of this palapala. And they didn't want this palapala to be taught to the rest of the citizens until they as leaders got to understand the power of the palapala. And in the meantime, go into the palapala, they were just dying to get this palapala themselves. And there are only a handful less than a dozen 
uh, missionaries that could go around to all our, our islands and teach the populace. So among the, uh, the chiefs and le the leaders of the time, they, they designated their own people, their own leaders to go among the populace to spread the word on how to learn to write, not only to write, but the reason you're writing is because it has this power of reading it and becoming literate in representing knowledge. So by the time of about 1820, uh, 1830s, 1830s, maybe 10 years, hence since the establishment of the official writing system, over 90% of the population became literate in our language. So this would be about the time of 1838 or so and establishing a, a school and the missionaries were the ones who of course understood more, so, I mean, even more so, uh, not more so, but even the power of, of writing because they were using this, this uh, means to Christianize our people by trans by writing a creating a Bible, translating the Bible to Hawaiian and their teaching, and the teaching of course became uh, part of uh, I mean writing it became a major uh, instrument to uh, implement to carry language to carry information knowledge etc or bringing the world into our Hawaii almost instantly. We didn't have to travel to France or to China or to any part of the world because this magical thing called writing brought the world to us as long as we could become literate and we did. And so I don't know in different parts of the world and every different forests of the world, I'm using the forest as a metaphor, all of these interactions that were happening at a certain time in our history and how they would eventually play a role in either becoming positive or negative or unnoticeable maybe towards the uh, situation of our language endangerment today. Uh, however, of course, uh, back then, uh, becoming literate was never thought of, of course, being in, becoming endangered. Uh, eventually, however, as the history of our independent country or our, as we became uh, a kingdom, because our king, Kamehameha, had conquered all the other uh, uh, how do you say, ruling classes or ruling uh, provinces or domains throughout our islands and put them under his domain, one rule. And that is called, of course, by in English, of course, we call it a, a kingdom, a dynasty. So this is the Kamehameha dynasty. And his heirs became the uh, heirs to his throne. I mean, a real fancy chair that they call a, chair, a throne. So uh, uh, when we get into the modern world, and if I can put this quite bluntly, uh, here we are, uh, Kamehameha himself, I think when he's, he was uh, asked by one of uh, Captain Cook's, um, was it Captain Cook's or was it John Vancouver in, he, they wanted to, this was probably Van, Vancouver's uh, artist wanted to do a sketch of him. And he insisted that he put on a, a vest and some fancy shirt. He, I don't even know what kind of style shirt yet we have. The, and uh, that's how he wanted to be um, uh, sketched. And so there he, that's what we have of our King Kamehameha when he was getting on in his years. Um, 
he, of course, took all of that off as soon as the artist did his thing and uh, went back into his loincloth. So I was going to say our, our kingdom happened to move from a loincloth, happened to move from human sacrifices on the temples into Christianity and into modern, we will just say modern, I don't know what modern was back then, but modern times, almost in a flash, very quickly. But the, the quickness was being assisted with this thing called liter literacy. And because the literacy is very much connected to the, the missionaries who really uh, earnestly pursued it and made it uh, an official orthography that we have today, uh, became very much a part, not very much, but played a role in several different parts of this establishment of a, what we would call a constitutional monarchy, which occurred uh, quite soon with the, uh, the early death of Kamehameha II. His eldest son died when he, he pursued a uh, treaty with the King of uh, Britain, King George at the time. And when he, Liho Liho, Kamehameha II and his consort wife went with their entourage on ship that took them over two months to get to London to negotiate treaty of protection for this little place. Now, how did our king, that king at the Kamehameha II, knew, know about this. They knew if they did not have some kind of protection as all this bombardment of outside ships that were coming in and many times taking advantage of our people as our people were confronting new ways and new uh, people and their ways, they, they noticed, of course, immediately that there were greater powers out there to contend with besides just their powers, which their father had to, and their ancestors or grandfathers and uncles that, you know, had to contend with in, in almost hand-to-hand -hand combat. So that's the kind of concern as leaders they were concerned about, and they decided that they needed to negotiate, they needed to have treaties. Well, unfortunately, when Kamehameha, and he was 23 years old, and his wife died of measles when they got to um, England, they contracted. Uh, and immediately, his brother, who was only, I don't know, 13, 14 years old, became the new king and served for almost 50 years as the King Kamehameha III. But as I'm saying, they're stepping out of a loin cloth, loin cloth into portraits that are being painted of them with suits and vests and neckties and bow ties and all this Western clothing. Probably right after that, they would go, get to be more comfortable in their more native wear, especially for the weather that we have in Hawaii. But all of, this is happening in a flash. And all of this adaptation uh, is happening in this forest, as I'm uh, meta uh, metaphorically using the forest in this mess of things, but still they are all interconnected, as we know. Things are just all being interconnected quickly. And what we, we don't, we, we didn't call this colonization, but colonization, we're gradually making its imprint in this process of becoming literate to the world in literature in Hawaiian now. This is everything was being done, the government and the constitution. The We set up a judiciary. We set up a whole system of uh, fee simple properties, which wasn't the case before. All of these new ways that a constitutional monarchy would set up was being established through our language. Now, the nice thing about that is not that it was consciously be done for documentation purposes, but that's what we call it today. But back then it was just part of being an independent country. 
I don't know how many different indigenous peoples of the world have that kind of history, but certainly there are. And so we have something in Hawaii that we can, uh, I guess, say we are thankful for that we have a, a repository of major use of our language of that time. You know, when time changes very quickly, especially as we live it today, there are new concepts, new ideas, new understandings that need to be transposed into our language. It's, it's a challenge when there has been a separation from a shift as we're getting into shifting into this mainstream or larger world. And for Hawaii, it wasn't French, it wasn't Russian, although those people were here trying to, you know, take over here as well, but it happens to be English. So that's the movement. And I'm not going to get into all of that within this 90 minute uh, workshop. Uh, that is something that I'm sure we can all be familiar with in, into a situation of language endangerment. Another thing that is uh, maybe kind of unique for our Hawaii forest, our Hawaii society, uh, this is more in recent times. Uh, well, let me finish this shift and endangerment that also included the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, the independent uh, country of Hawaii in 1893. And then eventually we moved into a republic and then of course, uh, we were overthrown by the United States of America. Of course, America took over Hawaii and then uh, became a territory of the United States in uh, 1890, 98, uh, 1959, that we became a state uh, of the union, the last, the 50th state. We were all campaigning to be the 49th state, but Alaska became the 49th state and we, Hawaii became the 50th. Now, all of that includes all of this part of this growth. I mean, when we look into a forest, all of these so-called uh, mess of uh, uh, connections, relationships, if you can call it that. And um, it plays, all of those things are important uh, in this whole network of how we um, not only understand how we came to become endangered, but how we are going to be working in trying to, if we can use the word reverse, or maybe I don't, maybe a, or do something about the death of our language that connects us to who we are, and of course that's for Hawaii and many of our people as time goes on, very important. And so I'm getting to that word cultural reawakening. And that did not happen to after statehood, but you see that the territorial days made a lot of us feel that we were second rate citizens. We had no power. We could not elect any of our uh, government officials uh, and then, of course, World War II was at our doorstep when we had Japan bombing our Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu at Pu'uloa. And World War II, coming out of World War II, and all of those kinds of political dynamics, social dynamics. Uh, may I, may I, uh, and something's been popping into my mind about my, I'm half Japanese, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the uh, planta sugar plantation days. And I was reminded about being half Japanese because during World War II, uh, many of our Japanese people, of course, were treated as the enemy. But I'm not gonna get into that, but I'm just getting into now <laughs> uh, different situations of uh, different languages, uh, immigrant languages, if I could put it that way, immigration. But this was a kind of an immigration of importing 
thousands of workers from to work on our sugar plantations here in Hawaii. That was the discovery of another industry that was a good money making here, growing our sugar here, but sugar cane. The um, uh, influx of all these different national Filipino, Puerto Rican, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, I think Gilbertese, other nationalities that came as workers. And many of these workers were just uh, plain old people. People who came from countries who actually were in poverty and could not take care of their own people. And this is a way of having their people find a livelihood to make some money. And part the dream was to send this big money back home to help their family back home. Well, the dream was not as dreamful as they thought it would be because the money was not really there. So many of those made Hawaii their home. So I have six different bloods because besides Hawaiian because of all of this import of people that came here. And I'm saying that in this forest, of different languages, different cultures, different people, different ways. We somehow came together on some common ground. And that common ground, in Hawaii anyway, was Hawaiian culture. The Hawaiian culture was still strong enough during the late uh, 1800s when the sugar plantation started to grow and become lucrative and in, into the early 1900s that it affected these people at that level because our citizens, our Hawaiian people were of the land of the same class, you might say, in the territorial days and evolving even into statehood. So this is um, today, as you come to Hawaii and you see Hawaii, uh, you, will, you cannot help but see that. Uh, on, I mean, lots of people may not you know, look out for that, but if, if you are aware of this, it is, a, uh, I call it a major, um, a major value of, uh, of uh, uh, advantage for an effort to re-recognize, reawaken to something that is very crucial to hearts and minds of people who respect that kind of exchange to the indigenous peoples of the place. The So I don't know in different places of the world if that's the same situation, the same kind of forests you have, it might be totally different. However, I'm just saying, as I was saying earlier, that this is more like a, a talk story kind of presentation about a, a hopefully some kind of an exchange that, that maybe we could recognize differences or recognize similarities that can be helpful in the direction of reclaiming and strengthening our languages in some way, in some form. And what are those advantages or even disadvantages? Because this, to recognize both are very important. Uh, the cultural awakening, as I said, was one factor was this coming out of uh, the territorial days into statehood. And when we had statehood, it gained more power That meant uh, decisions could be made easier. And some of these decisions, especially for Hawaii by that time, you know, tourism uh, become a major, it still is as today, the, a major uh, economy for the state. And lots of people love to live in Hawaii. It might have, might, it's expensive, but still, uh, Hawaii has so much real estate uh, and so there was some 
urban development moving out, especially on the main island of Oahu, where Honolulu is and Waikiki is. And so there was urban sprawl and uh, evicting of agriculturalists. And among those farmers were Hawaiian farmers that drew attention to, oh yeah, now what about the, the people of this place, the Hawaiian people? Um, awakening uh, or uh, uh, join some, not like 100%, but you know, at least some attention to that. Another curious thing that happened was uh, we always had Hawaiian music, especially as we were building our tourist industry, Hawaiian music, our hula, our dancing, our customs, our food, our luau and things like that uh, were important for that industry. So the music, some this music, the major defining, uh, how you say, uh, boundary of, I mean, the definition of uh, uh, Hawaiian music, uh, the lyrics in the language. You could jazz it up a little bit. You could make it sound like, you know, ragtime or something like that, because we had all those instruments that we took and made it Hawaiian, whether it came from Portugal or wherever it came from. Uh, Made the 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 bow on the bass. We made a standout bass with jazz music influence, etc., and the sound became unique to Hawaii. But the language was Hawaiian. So all I'm saying is that the the sound of Hawaiian music began to evolve to the ears of younger listeners, and not only younger listeners, but uh, yeah, to um you know, not necessarily needing to understand the meaning of er the words because the words were in Hawaiian. And at that time, most people didn't understand what the Hawaiian lyrics meant, but it's the sound of it and the way it was being, uh, you know, performed that caught the ear of lots of people, lots of people, not all, but enough to draw attention to this concern of now what's happening now that we've gotten out of the territorial days. Now we're a statehood. Now what about the Hawaiian, the native of this place? And um, I'll just mention here very briefly, Hawaii is unique. This forest that we have, our uh, native forest, we actually, uh, because of the territorial legislature in 1919, uh, when uh, the College of Agriculture in Hawaii uh, wanted to expand into the um, arts and sciences, uh, which required language uh, courses to be taken as a foreign language, uh, that would be Greek, Latin, French, and German, our territorial legislature said, look, what about Hawaiian? Because we speak Hawaiian. Our, our members of our legislature were actually, some of them were leftovers from the kingdom. Speaking uh, legislators in our territorial legislature in the early 1900s. So they said, okay, we can include Hawaiian as a foreign language that the uh, students at the now going to be called the University of Hawaii because we're now getting to the arts and sciences can take Hawaiian as a, uh, a course to fulfill their degree requirements. So that was established in 1919. Now we're talking a little bit about an institutional connection or relationship that occurred back then for Hawaiian language. Now, whether it played a role at that time for the reclamation of Hawaiian is a question because it never really, the enrollment, first of all, at the university at that time and even into later years, until current times, the at the university has never reached the, the uh, ratio that it it can be, and I think this is another whole other 
kind of topic that we could get caught up with. But to say that, oh, because we have Hawaiian language, therefore it would be the, the ethnic Hawaiian students to take this language course. It's not necessarily true. But what happened, however, as this reawakening was starting in 10 years after the uh, statehood in 1959, so more like 1969, 1970, the enrollment at the University of Hawaii increased by 500% plus in Hawaiian language. And these students were not necessarily all ethnic Hawaiian, but of course, whatever ethnic Hawaiians were enrolled, I would say at least 90% of them would be enrolling in taking Hawaiian because of this uh, awakening. And at that time, there were other issues had, uh, being um, confronted, you know, uh, with uh, Martin Luther King and the whole um, concern for the black movement and racism in the United States brought attention to such things as our own ethnic uh, identity in Hawaii. Now, I think we're going to take a pause. I think I have to take a pause. This is a more like a history lesson that I don't know if it's going to be about Hawaiian language uh, endangerment and reclamation and revitalization. So what I'm saying here is if any of you have any kind of uh, mana'o meaning opinion or thought, or it doesn't have to be a question, we'll take a little break and I can take a little pause and have some of my um, coffee. Yeah, so at this time we welcome any questions either, well, I guess through the chat, please. Um, and we can raise them and um, invite you to um, speak using audio if you'd like, if you'd like to present a question directly to Larry or Bruce. If not, we can continue, but uh, I'll wait a, a, a minute or so. Sure. So we have a question here, Larry. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but um, Noe Arista says, where do you see the connection between the digitization project and language and Mo'olelo Hawaii? My understanding of the word Mo'olelo Hawaii is, uh, is in our Hawaiian lexicon committee, we came up with a distinction between uh, such things, uh, well, mo'olelo can mean story, can mean history, can mean, uh, nowadays we call it literature because we are into writing our stories and as epic stories especially. Um, it can mean just an ordinary uh, narrative that I did today. You know, I had some visitors come to visit me and it was great talking with them. I mean, I can relate a narrative like that, a mo'olelo, a story. So digitization, of course, is the, the word now, uh, maybe it'll change in another 10 years, but maybe less. It's a means of preserving our mo'olelo, all of what I just explained, uh, as, except for the literature because, well, especially I'm, um, uh, you know, thankful that we can preserve our audio and our video and our moving pictures, especially to digitize that for use of for today. So I, is that the question? The importance of digitization is essential. And we are participating in that. I think a bit slow, as I mentioned a little earlier, I mean, we're just in the third or fourth year of our digitization of what we have at, um, at the College of Hawaiian Language. I was fortunate enough to get involved with a radio show that I hosted for 16 years and recorded over 525 or 50 hours. And then there are many more recordings that were that are just sitting on the shelf in their original form that needs to be digitized. So we have lots of work to do. Very important. 
we miss you. We don't see you too often in Hawaii. Are you? Well, I can't ask you that now. <laughs> Thank you very much to Noelani and to Larry for the answer there. We actually have another question in the general chat from Toshiaki Furukawa. And he asks, uh, Mahalo Anui Kumulale, you talked about intra-group integrity. I'm curious, what do you think of international learners of the Hawaiian language? Uh, yes, uh, this is how Hawaiian language, uh, as I, I think mentioned earlier, we encounter the world. <laughs> we encountered the world and we continue, of course. And of course, <laughs> today, I mean, that's not a question. The, the question is, how do we encounter the world? So international, especially from Japan, we have many students who are majoring in Hawaiian language. Uh, I believe, of course, Japan is a much interested in one of our cultural um, uh, arts of the hula and also of even Hawaiian music. And that has promoted the interest in Hawaiian language. I think it's great. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I just hope, uh, well, I know population wise, there are more Japanese people in Japan than, than they are in Hawaii. But I was going to say, I hope uh, our own people, and I know our own people here in Hawaii. When I say our own people, of course, I would say our ethnic Hawaiian people and just people that I would identify as people who have been here for generations, especially. Uh, and newcomers, I don't want to exclude anybody. As I said earlier, you know, everybody can learn a language. Everybody can learn Hawaiian. But when we get to into our own uh, endangerment, we would like to think that it is to do positive contributions towards the uh, revitalization of the language. And and cultural identity. So I, I, you know, it's it's great because you're interested in saying the traditional dance. Therefore, you would like to know more about the understanding of the uh, what makes you dance, which is the meaning of the dance, which is carried out in words in language. Uh, for Hawaiian music, there is no such thing as just music without words. So. Uh, in general, of course, our language is open to anyone. And then to be a little bit selfish about the uh, focus on the revitalization, uh, I think I said what I said about the um, hopefully that as well. Mahalo. I know our time is moving on, so we can move on to the next uh chunk here oh are there any more questions okay i don't think so at the moment uh but yeah folks free, feel free to drop in any questions um, yeah. during the presentation as well however how are they doing this through the chat or the q a i guess yeah so. they're uh so we just had one each um, okay a moment ago so uh, we'll just go on to this next topic which is so-called intergroup and i have here a, 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 a picture of our some log i mean trees actually still standing and these trees represent of course the hull of the canoe a major part of this uh, voyaging craft of this canoe which is very important for a sailing craft uh, ocean uh, going craft. Uh, but the, um, the photos that you see are the oldest kind that I could find. And, and that's me, even if you don't recognize me. Uh, <laughs> back then in, I believe it was 1972. But the group, how does a group come together? I think it's important for our reclamation or revitalization that the start um, has a, and there may be all kinds of groups and many groups, but it happened that this group 
uh, we're looking at this forest and trying to select a log that they could carve out to carry on a mission, a very simple mission that was for in Hawaii anyway. Uh, the return of the language to our families through the babies uh, to regenerate uh, the speakers of Hawaiian. And therefore, at that time, and very briefly, in 1980s, um, we had already come in contact with our P the last remaining community that happened to be on an isolated, privately owned island that we know today as Ni'ihau, and still is privately owned. Uh, the population has mostly moved off. However, back in the 80s, there are maybe still about 250 people. And among those people, and we came in contact, of course, with those people naturally by the 19, by 1972. By the way, this picture I could just explain very briefly is a demonstration at Kamehameha schools at the first uh, there's teaching Hawaiian as a course or second language. So this is a university class you see here. Uh, and among them, I can see uh, uh, Kalena Silva, I see uh, Lurleen Naione, I see uh, Ala Roy, I see Pila Wilson, and I only had about seven students in my fourth year class in, the, in those years. Um, but, uh, and then of course I see Kupuna here, um, this is, if I could say their names, of course, Rachel Uo, they came all the way from Keokaha by then, and Te Edith Kanako Oli had started on the Hawaiian homes at Keokaha kind of a, uh, how do you say, enrichment class in Hawaiian culture and language. And they joined us at this first meeting of Hawaiian language teachers. And so uh, from this teaching of Hawaiian, as I mentioned, it started back in 1921, uh, 1921 yes, at the University of Hawaii. Uh, to uh, boost. And so, uh, I mean, grow. And in this environment, we were so concerned that we were just teaching it uh, as a course. We didn't have a degree in Hawaiian language back then, uh, uh, just uh, Hawaiian language classes. And if uh, then eventually it led to some kind of liberal arts degree that you had to create on your own, but not, no such official degree back then. But the concern still was that we are looking at our kupuna, as you see in our picture, who are older than us. And I knew because my own grandparents had passed on and there was no Hawaiian being used as a real language spoken every day as though not when I was small growing up in Waimea in, in uh, Kohala. Uh, no, no. And, and now of course, we are we are seeing the last, of the very last of our native speakers, and they were all back then in '72 already in their senior years. So what I am saying is the recognition among some of us that we cannot continue to just do what we're doing and teaching it, uh, and uh, being you know champions about it in that way. We had to do something, and very basically returning the language to our babies. And this is the start of what we call the Punana Leo because the Punana Leo is a, a preschool age. We took them as young as two and a half years old, but we were legally supposed to take them at three. And then of course, we went, once we got into that kind of a system, uh, we were dealing with institutions of uh, learning, such as a, a preschool, which comes under the jurisdiction of certain governmental agencies. Qualified uh, teachers and uh, physical space, uh, dealing with parents and all of that. But we started it because we believed in it. If you spoke to a child only in his or her language, they will speak it back to you. And that's exactly what happened. And so this is where uh, from those early years, Moving on now to current times, 
uh, I'll just say it in gist, and then I know just the, I mean, excuse me, Bruce is going to be talking about the institution of what we're calling the fabric of Hawaiian language uh, revitalization, which is to the formal institution of schools. And uh, preschool is the uh, start of this, the, uh, the spark that had um, worked out successfully enough so that we could continue it all the way through. The goal was to continue it all the way through up to high school, which is about 16, 17 years of age. If you only do it for babies, uh, it's not enough. You, and if you only do it till they're about eight or nine years old, it's not enough. We had to do it all the way. And now we, of course, we have all the way up to the university level. We have established, of course, our BA in Hawaiian language, our master's in Hawaiian language, and a PhD in Hawaiian language. So within this time of about 40 years, this has been the history of the movement in using the institution called school, where we return the medium of education through our language, Hawaiian. And that happened in the kingdom. We had a whole public school system conducted in our language. And then eventually that got we were focusing on going vertical is be, well, two reasons. One is we didn't have that much personnel. We didn't have that much families to begin to prove this standard of education, but we had to do it all the way through because that's where we can see whether it can be uh, shared with other of our community people, our own families, our own family. And that's, that's eventually what worked out, thank goodness, uh, through all the dedication of just a handful of intergroup, is that the term that we're using? Uh, vision for revitalizing the Hawaiian language is pursuing and continues to because there's still, as I said, much more to be done in spite of the progress that has occurred. I think now we're going to talk for a little bit about this. It's not, yeah. It's not the most recent picture, but it looks like it's pretty old. I mean, not the most old picture, but it is pretty old. So for example, yeah, I start with to the left, uh, to your left at the back is now he's pure howling, Mr. Hokulani Cleland. He is currently working with the Ni'ihau community on the island of Hawaii. He is uh, one of the few licensed teachers at the Kula Ni'ihau o Kekaha in Kekaha, Kauai. And that has been going since 19, I'm uh, guessing here. I, I'm not sure, 1996, 97 or so. And of course, next to him to his uh, right, uh, left would be, as we move to the right, is Kawanoi Kamana. She's a former student of my fourth year class, not the first one, but almost close to the first one. And she has now become the wife of the gentleman to your extreme right, Pila, Dr. Pila Wilson, who's also a pure Hawaii, as we say in Hawaiian. So you don't have to be Hawaiian to be included in learning Hawaiian, and not only learning, but to be part of a handful of people who I would call the champions of moving this effort forward. And the gentleman uh, that I just ran over, what <laughs> skipped over is uh, Kiope Raymond, who is uh, um, of all oh, Kama'aina blood and of course, Hawaiian himself. And he just retired from teaching uh, as a professor, or associate professor at the College of uh, uh, University of Hawaii at Maui. And then going back to the left, we see Makalapua, who is a parent of Punana Leo, who had who went and pursued her licensing and becoming a certified teacher, and therefore she participated in establishing what we call now the Kamakau Manaya Kalani Kamakau uh, Hawaiian Immersion School, one of our six immersion uh, complete immersion sites 
uh, now at Haiku on Oahu Island. And of course, uh, next to her in the middle is Ile Beniamina from the island of Niihau. And she was very instrumental in um, helping us get a site that Kekaha, that Niihau School uh, on the island of Kauai now uh, is housed in. And of course, she was uh, the person who named the 30 or so young students back in 1980, less than 30, under the age of 17, who were native speakers of the Hawaiian language. And today in our school enrollments at the uh, Hawaiian Immersion or Hawaiian Medium Schools, we have over 3,000 students enrolled. But it's coming, we're still uh, moving forward on that. And of course, our 300 plus enrollment at our Punanaleo schools. So that is the regenerating, of course, of new speakers. Some of them we will claim to be native speakers because they are being raised, some meaning an estimate of about maybe 500 being raised entirely in Hawaiian in their homes before moving on into Hawaiian education. And of course, the main concern people say, oh, they're going to be speaking Hawaiian, they can't speak English. Well, no, uh, when, we, uh, when we use Hawaiian as a medium of education, they get to learn English not right away, but in the fifth grade, and they become very fluent in English, not a problem. It's not a problem. Okay. And one more little slide. And that's the pea or the sail, which is our familiar. We have a few videos here we'd like to share. And I think the videos will speak for themselves. The first one I'll just introduce, which you might miss, is uh, Herman Aizawa. Uh, the, uh, the first uh, uh, superintendent was Charlie Chuguchi, Charles Chuguchi, who uh, in 1987 was instrumental in allowing the first two sites in the Department of Education to be conducted entirely in Hawaiian. Then Herman came in later as he saw the progression of the, um, uh, what they called back then a, a, a trial uh, attempt to see how that we could teach in, in on entirely or educate our children entirely in Hawaiian. There were problems with people being concerned about English along with the Hawaiian. And so we had to work with that group of people. And uh, some of them came to the Board of Education, so we had to respond in, in public about it. But anybody who had very particular concerns, we worked basically with them. After maybe, I would say, three or four years, where they found that the students were doing just as well, as the non immersion students, that problem kind of went away. Essentially, it was not so much we pushing from our side, but the parents themselves had that belief to start with. And in, in regard to whether they were convinced, no, they came in pretty well convinced. And it's like anything else. In education, if you have your parents behind the child, they can overcome anything. And that's the important thing. Parent involvement was like at 100%. So we didn't have to say, you know, parents, maybe you should consider this program because it's going to be good for your child. We didn't have to do that. So uh, parents were crucial. In fact, parents became not all our parents, but they were the source of the future teachers that we have now and continue to have not just parents, of course, but especially in those early years, uh, to continue this uh, successful vertical move into, as I said, from, from K or from preschool, P, all the way up to 12th grade. Now we have another uh, video uh, just to illustrate uh, from the family's point of view, their involvement.
Alamana Mana is definitely that firstborn child the parents rely on to be the responsible caretaker. She gets good grades, she looks out for her little brother and sister, and she's also the first of her family in her first language. Her parents, Pele and Kekoa, started learning Hawaiian in college in the 90s. When we, when we started our family, we decided, okay, we're, we're all in. We're going to, for both of our families, we're going to reclaim um, Hawaiian as our, our language. Yeah, and so that's where um, Kalamana Mana was raised. That was her first language growing up. And after that, the rest of our children, we have a son, Kaumuali'i. How old is he? He's 13. <laughs> 13 going on 30. He thinks he's, he thinks he's older than that. And then um, Nali'i Poimoko, our youngest daughter, who's 12. Within both of our families, we would have had, you know, two generations of a gap of not being able to speak our language. And then um, seeing that in our kids, it really is a blessing to have been able to watch them grow up. Very different way that I think would have been more in a line with the way that my great grandmother saw the world around her with a better understanding of Hawaii. What was it like growing up? Because yeah. she had no choice, you know, we just kind of yeah. forced her to do it. Sometimes, I guess, family members who didn't speak Hawaiian um, had a hard time un understanding me because I was always mixing Hawaiian and English. So that was kind of difficult for me at times to communicate with others. But um, through being a part of Kikulao Navajo Kalaniopu, being a student here, has um, given me a lot of blessings. Um, being enriched in my Hawaiian language and my culture, understanding where my ancestors came from. It was I know it was very difficult for her. I, I mean, she had to learn the Hawaiian language later in life. And I know that I have for my mother and my father because they worked hard for, to put me and my siblings in this sort of education. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. <laughs> They're looking at one another and talking in Hawaiian and both of them have tears in their eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kalamanamana is a member of Navahi's 20th graduating class, soon to be a freshman at Dartmouth College, a world away in New Hampshire. So this is an example of a family that's raising uh, their children entirely in Hawaiian, regenerating new native speakers of the Hawaiian language for us today. Do we have time? Oh, we have one more video. Some of you may have already seen a little bit of this, but we'll play on a minute or so. A date that is etched in the consciousness of almost every Hawaiian, the day the Hawaiian kingdom was overthrown. At the time of the overthrow, it was used in all sectors of society by all of the kingdom citizens, from our homes and schools to businesses and government and even the halls of justice. In 1896, just three years after the overthrow, a law was enacted that stated, the English language shall be the medium and basis of instruction in all public and private schools. That one sentence dealt a smothering blow to our language. If you want to extinguish a people, you extinguish their language by taking it from the ears and mouths of future generations. You take it away from their children. Piece by piece, action by action, the racist, provisional, and republic government and others with influence attempted to stem the flow of oxygen to our Olelo Hawaii. But they delegated to use in isolated spaces, even perhaps to whispers in private. We spoke and we spoke in Hawaiian. We kept the embers burning for nearly a century. So how do you revive a language? The same way they tried to extinguish it. We share it with our children. So 
Uh, Kai Kahele was born in the mid 1970s at the time when I was talking about uh, so called reawakening of our Hawaiian culture and language. And uh, today, of course, he's now a representative in Congress for the state of Hawaii. He's also a parent of two daughters who are, are in the Hawaiian language uh, uh, medium education system of Hawaii and a very proud parent, of course, and he's doing his best to learn Hawaiian along with his wife, Maria, as well. So the familial and the regenerated uh, Hawaiian uh, effort, Hawaiian speakers and the efforts put into uh, regenerating these speakers for today. Now, I've been talking too much. I have to allow at least some minutes to Bruce here, uh, who's uh, working on our our documentation project, or we were talking about the new, uh, the Ekahi Molina Kiri, the Iako, the Outrigger. Aloha Kako. I'll be talking very shortly so we have time for questions um, about Ka Iako, the Outrigger boom. This section, you see the float outside in, in the Kai in the water, the Ama. So the Iako sort of connects that flow and gives stability to the va'a. And for va'a or canoe is Hawaiian language revitalization. It's sort of an important piece uh, to keep moving forward. So I as a L2, as a second language learner, I did not grow up speaking Hawaiian. I've only been in the language for about six years now. And in fact, as I started college, uh, the idea came to my mind to start learning Olelo Hawaii um, for, for many reasons, because of the connection I have to this place that I now call home. Um, but I just want to drive the point home that formal education through institutions is the main powerhouse of the Hawaiian language revitalization movement. And it's through that through that medium that people like me, um, which are most of our new L2 speakers, are very blessed to be able to learn the Hawaiian language. And I think Larry was saying earlier that it's been taught in institutions in college since 19, 19, 1921. But as he was saying about the Hawaiian Renaissance, the cultural reawakening, that was very important in raising awareness just because it was there since 1921 it wasn't until the 70s that actually enrollment from the I believe it was the 50s to the 70s but really in the 70s enrollment in those classes shot up on a staggering 500 percent so it was due to that spark that people got interested in it and another catalytic event was the foundation of the Punana Leo in 1983. And because there was the realization that kids, the keiki, were not speaking the language and it was really the older generation and it was really at risk of disappearing. So there was that critical step of establishing entirely in the Hawaiian language with no English. The school is run through Hawaiian and the kids are taught their lessons through Hawaiian. And in fact, we're not teaching them language, we're teaching them content through the language and the language is picked up along the way. Um, yeah. So another thing that had to be faced while developing these schools was meeting requirements. There were requirements of the Department of Education and governmental and education requirements, but there are also the requirements for that we have on our philosophy of education, not that just that we're doing it in the Hawaiian language, but also the cu cultural knowledge and, and a foundation is established, not just teaching the math and reading and writing, which is all very important, but also how affecting how they see their way so this grew from the punana leo and it grew it was sort of a vertical expansion 
instead of growing and having a bunch of Punanaleo, a bunch of preschools, it sort of grew from year to year and this stacks grades upon grades. And it grew more slowly in the number of schools because there was more of a focus on getting an education to the keiki from the time they were old enough to go to school at about three years old, all the way to graduating 12th grade high school. And then more horizontal expansion uh, happened later. And now we have 21 sites across the islands. Six are complete K to 12 institutions where children can go to school in the language from kindergarten. And then after, then what happened? Uh, tertiary institutions where you can get your master's degree in Hawaiian language or your bachelor's degree, I should say, like I just graduated with, and you can continue on to gotcha. master's and even go to different schools just because you learned in Olala Hawaii it doesn't mean that you're restricted to only studying in the Hawaiian language. As we saw in the video just now, um, Kala Manamana went to a prestigious school on the continent called Dartmouth. But we also have here at Hale Olelo, the picture on the right, in the upper right hand corner, uh, various programs such as Kahua Viola, a teacher education program. And teachers and the generation of L2 teachers really makes the fabric, the machine of Hawaiian language revitalization run. It's a sort of cycle. And all these support Hawaiian language revitalization and institution, the education is critical in keeping this cycle going and it allows a foundation and hopefully we can expand beyond just having the language and education, but into all aspects of life in the community. And because of time, I'll cut it short right there and we'll go to the next slide. Uh, no, but basically, Mahalo. And, you know, everything else, can, <laughs> the relationship, I mean, government will always be there. Uh, we have some forms of government. And it's basically what it says here on this slide that hopefully the government, not hopefully, we will make the government recognize the possibilities and values of our language, such as through an institution of learning and that they can set up supportive policies, which they gradually get about come about doing it. But of course, it has to be a uh, process and it helps to um, show them, to convince them that this is possible and it can be a very beneficial, uh, not only to a certain group of people, but to all people. Uh, indigenous peoples who are in this kind of situation. So this is where uh, hopefully that the, let's go to the next slide, can um, the new uh, generating of new speakers, of course, can serve as the steering paddle that can uh, bring about um, changes uh, in the future. And so the questions, of course, I always ask is, but of course, we can address um, more projects and more efforts always. And um, we are going to rely more and more on uh, motivated to pursue those kinds of efforts. And um, thank goodness uh, they, uh, they are qualified to go on to tertiary education. Uh, one, uh, our school here in Navahi, Okalani Pool has 100% high school graduation and 80% going on to higher education all over, uh, all over the world. Not necessarily, of course, just in Hawaiian language, uh, uh, becoming a Hawaiian language teacher or a Hawaiian language curriculum developer or things like that. Although those are very much urgent needed uh, uh, areas but they can, uh, they, the, the world is at their doorstep and at their footstep, I should say. And they are going to be the, uh, they are the uh, steering paddle for the craft of this, our canoe in, in making sure that we will uh, 
and landfall and landfall as we go. And with that, mahalo nui, mahalo to the National Science Foundation for helping make all this possible and to the ICLDC committee and all of the limahana of the workers and everyone who made this possible. Mahalo nui loa. So we have some time for a couple of questions or a few questions. I'm not sure, Sebi, that's up to you. <laughs> well, yeah, mahalo, first of all, to you too, Larry and Bruce. Thank you very much for the lovely presentation there. Um, yeah, we will have to leave at 8.50 um, and, you know, in order to make space and time for the following uh, sessions. But I believe we could probably do one question if somebody would either like to come in and um, audibly say their question or just drop it in one of the chats. Uh, audibly. Otherwise, yeah, we do have this option to um, for folks to enter the social lounge and continue any conversations. That's in the chat here, um, posted by the host, Bonnie. And I can repost so that. Have, yeah, that's right. We have a social lounge that we could go to for a little while. Definitely, yeah. So that's open yep, during all hours of the conference and folks are more than welcome to go there and continue conversations. Oh, we do actually have a, we do have a question here, Larry. Um, and this comes from Ka'iu Kalani Damis. And Ka'iu Kalani asks, are there any efforts being made to make available more repositories of Hawaiian recorded material like Mrs. Pukui's work? Yeah, I hope you can pursue that more. Uh, when she, when uh, Ka'iu mentions uh, Mrs. Pukui's work, brand, there's a brand on that. So uh, we'll have to uh, uh, talk with the Bishop Museum. I'm sure they'd be open. Uh, and uh, there, of course, it's available on a, um, how do you say, control basis or a limited basis, but it's available. Uh, it's harder now with the COVID because the Bishop Museum hours are very restricted or probably they're, I don't know if they're open really now at the library, but yes, definitely. And we're working on other repositories too. I'm sure Kayu knows about the Mana Leo with uh, High Lama folks and uh, perhaps some other repositories that we can, uh, I guess, make it easier. You know, we have um, sometimes they're kind of scattered or uh, uh, not totally, uh, not, not the whole collection available. So there's lots more work that can be done to make all of these repositories. Well, I say all, but I... Kaiu ko ko na na anamaya mako ke mau ke ahi ahi. Mahalo. Okay. Thank you to Kaiu and yeah, thanks again to the presenters. And you know, we we also welcome for all of you folks who didn't get a chance or want to perhaps expand on some of these um, directly with Larry and Bruce. You can attend the second session of this workshop. So that's going to be on Sunday. This is all Hawaii time, Hawaii Standard Time, but Sunday, 9 a.m. Um, so feel free to come by again for another workshop session. Mahalo to you, Sebi, and everyone. Right, yeah, last words for, for you. Uh, yes. Yeah, last words for you and uh, Bruce there, Larry, please. Mahalo ko ho'olohi anam.